Now, here's the good news. You don't have to listen to me all day. This is the last one. And the next good news is that when we get done with this panel, we're going to have lunch. I'll invite our panelists, if you'd like to come on up uh, and take a seat wherever you like, we'll be good to go. Um, if you're from the South, Zippy, you probably have heard a fellow named Jerry Clower. And Jerry talked about Marcel Ledbetter receiving a letter from home and he was hotter than hooping on the beach. And they said, boy, what's wrong with you? He said, they done throwed a cray soap pole in our front yard. Now what that meant was they were about to get electricity. In 2009, in my home state in the western part, we got just shy of two inches of ice. Took down poles, took down towers, my home went without electricity for two weeks. And you never appreciated technology so much that if you once had it and didn't, you never appreciated technology more that you finally have it. My babysitter, when I was this big, had an outhouse and I never looked forward to winter. We're talking about technology here today. And certainly there are technologies that we enjoy that improve our, our way of life. But how many of you are parents? You know the difference in the baby cry that says, hold me. You know the difference in the baby cry that says, I'm tired. And is there anyone any more piercing that says, I'm hungry? The technologies that have come to this industry, not just in productivity, but these technologies that can feed hungry people, that can change lifestyles. These technologies, and, and I've talked about herbicide-resistant crops for a long time, but I finally broke down and spent the money in my garden at home, Mr. Vroom. I spent the money to get genetically enhanced corn that would allow me to spray a herbicide over the top and wax out the buds. And it rained and it rained and it rained some more, and I put glyphosate over the top of that crop for the first time. I didn't have to till, thank heaven, and the, the yield of those varieties was twice the other. And adults didn't have to worry about bugs at the end either. We have a horticulture business at home and we raised 7,500 uh, mums. And what did I didn't know, but army worms love mums. And in a, power, a period of time of about six hours, we had lost about 10% of a crop. What would have happened had there been for me, and it's just a, an ornamental plant, had there been some resistance that I didn't have to go in and spray. But I spray I did and I laughed while they died. <laughs> where would we be without this technology and where can we go if we embrace these technologies? We're living in a time of rapid agriculture, technological and scientific advancement. Innovation is at work everywhere we look. But what good is innovation without global market acceptance? Our panel today here to discuss the ties between trade technology and productivity and how to overcome the market obstacles that are standing in the way of advancement. We'll take a look at emerging technologies. We'll discuss their impacts on U.S. agriculture from the lab to the land. And with that, we've got great panelists for this. First, I'll introduce Andy Levine, the CEO of the American Seed Trade Association. Prior to joining ASTA, he served as Executive Vice President and CEO of the Florida Citrus Mutual as President and Executive Director of the Florida Fertilizer and Agrochemical Association. Levine also spent a decade on Capitol Hill, a Legislative Director for Representative Charles Kennedy and as an Agriculture Committee staffer for Representative Tom Lewis. He also has been active as an advocate and leader surrounding biotechnology and plant breeding innovation, serving on various national committees and advisory groups for USDA, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, APHIS and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Andy Levine. Give him a hand. Now, many of you know our next panelist uh, from the American Farm Bureau Federation, where she became a fixture in D.C. agriculture, lobbying for food and uh, farm policy issues. Mary Kay Thatcher, most recently the Senior Director of Congressional Relations for AFBF, is now leading federal affairs with Syngenta. Her expertise ranges from farm programs and crop insurance to conservation and credit issues. Her roots in the agriculture industry run deep. She's a fifth generation Iowa farmer and has produced corn, soybeans, and livestock on her farm for 23 years. Please welcome Mary Kay Thatcher. Next up on our list is Tom Slate, the CEO of the U.S. Grains Council. Slate has spent much of his career between 1983 and 1999 with the Grains Council, both domestically and abroad. 
He then worked at the Virginia Department of Agriculture, served as the executive director of the New York Viability Institute. He played an integral role in the founding of the New York Center for Dairy Excellence, an initiative to revitalize the state's dairy industry. He returned to the Grains Council in 2010, vice president, and now has been serving as the organization's president and CEO since 2012. Tom Slate. And our final panelist is Margaret Ziegler. She is the executive director of the Global Harvest Initiative. She's devoted her career to addressing global hunger and food security. Previously, she served as deputy director of the Congressional Hunger Center, where she worked closely with the public and private sectors, nonprofits, industry leaders, and policymakers to promote food security initiatives. She's also a member of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Foundation for Food and, Ag and Agriculture Research and is on the board of directors of the Association of International Agriculture and of Rural Development. Please welcome Margaret. Uh, Tom, you're gonna, Tom, you're going to help me out because I'm going to transition over there, but I'm going to kick this off. Tell us about technology and U.S. agriculture. Looking at our competitors around the globe, do we still have the advantage? Same question for the group. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I usually get to the office about 7 o'clock in the morning, and the first thing I do is get myself a cup of coffee and click on daybreak, so it's kind of hard to listen to you, Jeff, without a cup of coffee list right here in front of me, but uh, really do enjoy your work and enjoy working with you. Some say it's hard to listen to me, too, so anyway, <laughs> that's you. Uh, and so competitive, you know, competitiveness, and this is something that we actually look a lot of, about in terms of uh, how the U.S. is ranking up in the world. And the thing I've always said is the, the, you know, the floor of competition rises every day, and it's been like that for a long time. But I still think, you know, U.S. agriculture is highly competitive. I think a lot of the things that have been said already you are going to hear a little bit here in this panel as well. We're still very competitive in terms of our, our, you know, our, our technology, our, our management, our use of digital agriculture, precision agriculture, uh, our ability to, you know, customize, uh, you know, supply uh, in terms of uh, what the customer wants, how they want it, when they want it, and what form they want it. Uh, our, our, grain trading, our grain standard system, our, our contract sanctity, everything about the U.S. agriculture system is still top of the, top of the line. But, you know, it, you always have to have that but. But the thing is that the floor of competition is rising every day. And when we see gains in South America, we've watched that for decades. Uh, the thing that we're watching, you know, very closely now is the rise of Russia, our UK, Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, how they are investing in agriculture and, again, right floor, floor of competition rises every day. We have a lot of competition around the world. I still think the U.S., it, particularly the crops I represent, the, the coarse grains, still leads the world. Uh, we, are the, we are the strongest supplier, and I think we have to maintain that competitive advantage however we can investment in infrastructure, investment in technology, investment in management, however we can, sharpen that, that, that edge every single day because we have people biting at our heels. Margaret? It's a great question. And yes, um, the American producer is really um, you know, the, the producer par excellence globally still. Um, a lot of that has, has come from our long-term investments in productivity and agricultural research and development and extension. Um, this has really been the foundation for our incredible rates of productivity. And I, I'm speaking probably to a, a, a highly educated audience about this, but one thing I always say when we talk about productivity, uh, it's not production. It's not just output. Productivity, as we measure it at the Global Harvest Initiative, and, and we use data from USDA's Economic Research Service, is a ratio of output to inputs. And essentially, the American farmer and rancher, over time, has become the most productive in terms of, of output relative to inputs anywhere in the world. This is an amazing success story. And that trajectory has come because um, of investments in public research and development, extension, uh, partnerships with the private sector, obviously, embracing innovation and technology, and best practices. So the, the American producer is highly productive. 
Um, and that is also laying, laid an amazing foundation for sustainability in agriculture, uh, which is something we, we oftentimes disconnect, but it's, it's a foundation for sus sustainability. But yes, there are roadblocks, and, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we go forward. But um, uh, we're concerned about it at, at GHI, and I think that we're, we're aiming to really raise the, the consciousness of those, not just in the ag sector, but outside the ex, ag sector, about what is productivity, what is the benefit for consumers, farmers, and sustainability, and how can we keep, keep going. Mary Kay, is this the place? Is this the country, and are these the farmers that are leading, or are there other fields and other countries that are proving an excellent place to start? Oh, I, I think without a doubt that uh, American farmers still are the most innovative, and they're always willing to try the new technology. Um, I think, you know, the U.S. continues to be uh, set the right market standards for investment in the country on a whole host of things, but I think both Tom and Margaret make great points. I mean, we have not done as well with our research funding, uh, especially for our public research funding as we should have done. Um, we had great strides on infrastructure, but my gosh, how long have we talked about the locks and dams needing help, uh, roads, et cetera. Um, and then certainly you turn to the whole regulatory landscape and what's gonna happen there. And I, I think we have huge battles coming at us. Andy, there's a lot of new seed and your companies that are a part of your group are looking for innovation. Is this the place to plant them? Well, I, I, I will agree with everyone uh, on the stage here. I think the American farmer is by far head and, head and shoulders above in the competition arena, but the, the uh, stage is rising. And if you look today where a lot of the uh, innovation is uh, developing, a lot of the research is going, we started here in the U.S. We, we train a lot of PhDs in the U.S. and then they go home. And a lot of the developing world is starting to, to uh, innovate. And when we look at the conversation earlier, you know, the environment for trade agreements 20 years ago was completely different because a lot of times there wasn't another market to go to. And we've seen already in Mexico there's another market to go to. Uh, if, if they want to look at other grains. It's the same in the research community. And today, if you look, go and go to our good buddy Google and, find, and type in gene editing, the first 10 or 20 or 30 are going to come from China. They're not necessarily coming from our backyard of, of the great land-grant university system we have, but a lot of those were trained here in the United States. It's still a very great place to do it. We will still be very, very competitive, but the challenge that we continue to have is what does the policy look like with respect to innovation coming into our industry. And it doesn't matter whether it's the big data, it doesn't matter whether it's gene editing or, or some other breeding method or new biotech traits, new chemistries. You know, we're starting to feel that pressure of, uh, is this the right place to innovate? And this was the pressure that Europe has been feeling for a number of years. And uh, you can talk to, to Mr. Vroom about what the Europeans are thinking about where they want to be essentially being producing just organic in, in the next five to ten years. Is that where we want to go in this country? I don't think so. And I think we set the, the base for um, innovation long ago. We set that stake in the ground. We set up the land-grant institutions and the public-private partnerships. And today, some of those are on a little bit shaky grounds. And I think we've got to, we've got to buckle back up and, and get that support back to them and the funding. Okay, so we've pushed off the shore. We've got our toe wet. Now we're in. Please feel free to, to, to talk to each other. Feel free to, to introduce a question yourself. Let's make this a hearty discussion and don't let me get in the way. And for the folks that are there, you Slido, uh, I've got a, a, a pad up here, an iPad, that infernal fruit that hopefully will allow me to see your questions. Uh, and we'll make this a group discussion if we can. All right, so now let's move a little bit to the next realm. Is the U.S. regulatory environment, is the U.S. government, is this the fertile field now where, Andy, Companies want to introduce a product for the first time, or are there better environments? I still think it is. The future is um, maybe not as clear, but today I still think it is. I think that companies come here because they see um, a good base to work with universities, and they see a market that is, is pretty accepting of innovation. But as, you, as we saw through the battle with the GMO labeling issues, as we see today with the food community trying to figure out what transparency is, transparency is our new sustainability for agriculture. But the farmer, remember all those years we went through, what's sustainability? We've got to be sustainable. Well, sustainable has been put off the table, and it's now transparency in the food system. Well, how much 
do we need to tell the consumer? How much matters? All of those kind of things, and we're having those discussions today. And I think that's going to impact innovation in the future all the way down the food chain. Margaret, from your perspective, how important to make sure that this is the place that companies want to bring the newest product? Well, I think uh, from our perspective, we, we hope that uh, countries all around the world embrace innovation and technology. We think that there's uh, scope for all farmers and all societies to move up that productivity ladder. ladder. Um, but in the U.S., of course, we want to be and continue to be the world's leader in productive, sustainable, safe, high-quality agriculture. Um, that's been our role, and we don't want to cede that role to China. You know, China right now is outspending us for the first time in history in ag research and development, two to one. So uh, the concern we have is we've got to make sure that in our, all of our efforts, whether they're public, private, partnerships, that we, we have that foundational structure available, that pipeline for research, development, innovation, and attracting the capital and talent to make it happen here in the U.S. Mary Kay, I'm going to come back to you. Tom Slate, what happens when we get the cart ahead of the horse? When we embrace it and we like it and it works for us here, and suddenly our customer decides that maybe they're not ready to embrace that quite so quickly. What's the downside? Well, I don't really want to live the uh, last several years of my life, but uh, we've been dealing with that question a lot. And I think that what, what we have learned from this is that we need to make sure we're reaching out and answering these questions proactively. These questions that these consumer groups have, this transparency, as you mentioned, Andy, I think it's, it's a really good point. And, and regain that confidence in U.S. Uh, agricultural systems, U.S. regulatory systems that are respected around the world. Regain that confidence, regain that trust. And I think that, yeah, we, we've had some incidences where you got out ahead, but I think continuing that dialogue, and, you know, again, picking up on what Ted said, showing up, engaging, talking, and talking about transparency, talking about sustainability, talking about what these projects are doing for environmental you know, benefits, things like that. And we can start learning from those lessons and inform, get a regulatory framework that is you know, adaptive to technology, doesn't stifle innovation, and is informed by, by what we have done in the past to be able to have better decisions, quicker decisions, less cantankerous decisions. Mm -hmm. Mary Kay, how important for a company like Syngenta to continue to bring new technologies? You can't rest on your laurels, can you? Oh, no, absolutely not. And, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, and Darcy Vetter said it very well this morning when we think about um, uh, trade agreements, uh, you know, we're not going to solve the problems that we may have with one country here and one country there doing bilaterals when we're thinking about this regulatory environment. It's, it, it's far better to try to do that at a WTO level to work uh, even closer on codex and some of those things uh, to resolve some of those sanitary, phytosanitary issues, uh, just the regulatory barriers that go on. And I think, you know, certainly there are things in our regula regulatory process that we could uh, do much more efficiently, and we all work on those things. Uh, but I think making sure that we get uh, as much of a regulatory environment that works around the world uh, is where we will really step up to the plate. Andy, the companies that you work with, as similar to, to Mary Kay, looking for new technologies, biotechnology, it's, it's an ocean. We've only touched the edge of it. Let's talk about the regulatory system in the U.S. Is it consistent and is it up to date with the science that we have today that would allow your members and, and, and other companies to introduce those products and, and expect a, a fair regulatory judgment? I think it's, we, we can't expect a fair regulatory judgment. I wouldn't say it's up to date. And if we look back at the process, the coordinator framework was developed to evolve, which was a novel concept because we know most regulations don't evolve, whether they're in agriculture or not. And it has not evolved. And unfortunately, we, under uh, uh, President Bush, in the, near the end of it, um, I see our good friend Bruce Knight, uh, they introduced a change to Part 340 in the Bush administration. It sat there for seven years under the Obama administration, was pulled at the end, a new one was introduced, and we've pulled it again. So we're 10 years at least of trying to make modifications to update it as we've gained experience with GMOs, as we've gained experience with 
the products traits coming into the marketplace. So much like any other technology, whether it's our, our phones, whether it's our, uh, our cars, and whether it's uh, plant breeding and, and biotechnology, the regulatory process cannot keep up with the rapid change of innovation. And our government has to think about it from a different way, but we as an industry have to bring solutions to them to say, maybe regulation is not the right way to go here. And I'll just throw out, we got part 340, it goes through a security, safety process and review process. Does the public really think any better about GMOs today than they did 10 or 15 years ago? And people say, well, we, we need a regulatory process. Well, we've got it, what has it done for us? And so we've got to think about how we look at innovation in the future differently. And we've got to bring solutions to the table because if we start, and we're about to start again with the, with the uh, Trump administration on uh, re revisions to part 340, by the time we get this through, even if it's three or four years down the road, our innovation is going to pass that quickly. So it, it's just tough to keep up with and we've got to think differently to help provide solutions. I'm thinking about the scientist in the lab who has been for months or years looking and looking and looking, and he finally finds the, 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 the golden egg. And he's like, wow, this would do this and this and this and this. And he takes it to the boss, and the boss says, yeah, that's a good idea, but we can't get it approved. Go back to your room. How much science is being left in the lab that would benefit our farmers today because of the system that we have? Anybody want to take a handle on that one? Guess not. <laughs> well, I, I, just again, I, 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 there is a lot of science out there. You talk to uh, anybody in the, in the plant breeding community, uh, the biological uh, evolution that's happening today, the, the, our ability to better understand what makes plants do what they do, the characteristics of wild relatives versus our domesticated lines that we bring into the marketplace is phenomenal right now, Jeff. And, that ability to then determine what's the policy going to be with respect to breeding methods as they evolve. What's the policy going to be if I want to bring a trait uh, into a, um, a spinach to get rid of downy mildew or to be able to spray over my mums? Those markets are so small, a company cannot bring that characteristic or that trait to market. And as long as there's not a viable uh, means to commercialization, that stuff will sit on the, on the shelves of our either private companies or our public universities. Tom, how tough it? That is, though, I think, uh, an opportunity for us in that, you know, the gene editing technology is going to allow us to do things much quicker, much more efficiently, less costly, et cetera. And I think it will allow those smaller companies to bring some of those products to the market. And, and I sort of look at, you know, I, I come back to your question and I think, uh, in some respects, we have an opportunity right now in that would we like to probably have had two or three more years to think about gene editing and how we phrase the conversation? Uh, yes. Uh, is it out there? And uh, is it like everything we've talked about already today? And we probably will talk about where uh, agriculture and agribusiness has to do a better job telling its story. Yes. Um, but, you know, you look at the uh, several series piece that you and others at AgriPulse did on gene editing. That, that was a great start to get more people to talk about it. So I do think that we have an opportunity right now with our regulatory process if we do put the right story together uh, to make a really positive impact compared to other things that we've done in the past. I also think, just to jump in, um, there's some really innovative novel ways that, that companies are doing research now. We have lots of small startups that are addressing issues that um, may be of more interest to consumers. Um, rather than only solving problems on the farm. Uh, and I think that that's a great trend. I think that hopefully um, some of the things that are coming out of these, these startup and ventures will create some positive buzz and understanding about the, the power of the new, uh, new sciences that we have to solve problems, not just for farmers, ranchers, but also for a wider part of society, nutrition, health, um, the environment. I'll tie it back to your first question, Jeff. <clears throat> From a farmer point of view, they want these new traits. They need, to, you know, cost of production. We talked about that a lot this morning. Farmers, you know, selling below the cost or above, below the cost of production. They need to c continue to improve their competitiveness through these traits. I don't know how much is being left in the laboratory, but I know farmers are surely pushing for more and more traits, and that's why it's so important to get this regulatory framework figured out. Because again, floor of competition rising every day. They need them. How tough is it for you to sell if you're not the lowest cost producer in the room? 
Well, it depends on the market. Uh, <laughs> but usually the, the most important thing in the export market is price, and the second is price, and the third is price. And then after that, you know, maybe comes uh, delivery. But it is hard. We're, we're actually having a very strong export scheme right now in feed grains. Uh, things are going well. We, we had a great year in 2016, a really good year in 2017. 2018 is off to a strong year because we're very competitive to the world market right now. And uh, that's really sustaining, uh, you know, farm income in, in many ways is that growth and that, you know, you know, like Ted has said earlier, you know, to the you know, big countries, our loyal uh, markets, you know, not forgetting them. So that's sustaining us and we're sustaining us because we're very competitive right now, both in that and in DDGs and even in ethanol. We're very competitive and we're, we're really kicking it right now. Hey, here's a news tip for you. If you're looking for the latest, like the latest tip on, on agriculture and news that's going on, there's this website called agripulse.com. And, and then on the front page of that, if you look over at the left side, there's this program that comes up every week called Open Mic. And, and if you were to go there this week, you would see Dr. Jason Lusk from Purdue University who talks about his research of asking consumers about GMO. Should GMOs be labeled? 80, 90 percent, yes, absolutely. Similar question, do foods that have DNA, should they be labeled? 80, 90 percent, absolutely, yes. Are we asking for an uninformed consumer with an opinion to guide the direction of this industry, and what's the danger? Gee, that's an easy one, huh? <laughs> that's a good one. You ask them how many also knew what a GMO was, though, Jeff. <laughs> and, and there's where we are now because you're moving on to gene editing. You're moving on to other layers of science, and they really don't understand present day and where you are, yet they're setting the directive of who's elected, who's setting policy, who's setting the direction for the industry. Who's driving this ship, and what happens if we don't communicate that message? For, for me, there has to be some sort of for us, the work we do on the export side, some sort of international forum that presents science in an unbiased way. That's not happening right now. And we need that, that voice somewhere. Like U.S., you know, I can't go there and say, you know, trust it because, you know, it's from the U.S. There needs to be that sort of international validation, science in an unbiased way. That's what we need, and that's what's not happening right now. And I think we've got it, and we are working to um, have that unconventional conversation. We, we've heard this for years. Mary Kay and I were just making comment about your introduction and making us both feel old. But I remember starting on Capitol Hill, and it, back then we didn't. We talked really well within the agriculture community, but we didn't talk to the public. Well, it's really coming home to roost now. And as we talk about changes in breeding methods and our understanding of genetics and those kind of things, the, the public doesn't get it, and it scares them. You know, if they take it a pill and it makes them healthier, they don't care. But if it's on their food, if it's on their plate, they care about that. So how do we have that conversation in a different format, in a different way, to help people understand that this is just because of discoveries that we've made. This is science. This is things that are good to uh, make it more sustainable, be better for our environment, be better for our health, and those kind of things. We can't just talk about it being better for the farmer. You know, uh, we have this conversation, and Margaret is, is right. Uh, we have people in the vegetable seed business, vegetable produce business, that are not going to bring products to market until they have some certainty that they're auto not, not automatically going to be labeled GMOs. And when that happens, that is a, a detriment to our industry as a whole. That means that the public doesn't want us to evolve. They don't want us to bring science and innovation into our industry, which is a big mistake. Um, and so how do we talk about it as an industry with our food companies, with our retailers who are going to have to help us carry the message? And we've got to be transparent about it. And you all have done a great job of opening your farms, letting them on to see what happens. We're trying to do the same thing, opening up our demonstration plots, opening up our labs, our greenhouses, and others. Say, There's nothing here but new things happening and, and innovation that's been being developed by your local land-grant institution in partnership with uh, the public, uh, private entity. So we've got to be a wide open book. And I think as we uh, jump look at the, the export markets that, uh, I mean, we all know that we tend to be risk-based, science-based on our regs here, or mostly so at least. Uh, but you go to Europe and it's not risk-based, it's hazard-based, it's precautionary principle. And, you know, we also know that what starts in Europe eventually comes here for virtually everything that happens. So that's a very scary thing. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, does seem to have worked somewhat to sort of try to go around that problem and maybe 
change the conversation somewhat is, for example, Syngenta has a program, as I know other companies do too, about working with smallholders in countries like Africa, where um, you know they're much more concerned, obviously, about feeding the people, but when they see this new technology, they're much more acceptive of that kind of a thing. And uh, so if we can work our way into those kinds of markets so that the Europeans don't capture this precautionary principle first there, that would be a really useful thing down the road. Margaret? Right, and then uh, I think obviously helping smallholder farmers, but also working alongside um, leaders in developing countries uh, with respect to food security, sustainability, uh, productivity, all of those things are very, gonna be very important for companies to think about and to, d to form really um, viable long-term partnerships, showing up, being there, it may take time. But our research is showing that by 2030, most countries in sub-Saharan Africa are only going to meet about 8% of their food demand uh, through productivity. Now, they're going to need to trade, they're going to need to import, but they're going to need to have more productive, more sustainable innovations and practices. And I think the time is now to, to participate in that process, um, not to just beat up on China, but China is, is already moving into this space in Africa. They see it as a long-term market. And I think um, there's a really great opportunity to, to right now be present, um, participate with market development, regulatory development in sub-Saharan Africa, and, and to provide a number of benefits to uh, populations there. Seems like I read the news that maybe China purchased a part of a very large agricultural company not long ago. Uh, Mirke, do you think the fact of this purchase Will it change the mindset of the Chinese government with regard to technology outside looking in? Um, I, I don't know that we've seen progress yet. You heard Ted talk about his uh, trait that he worked on in 2009 or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think last summer we got four traits through China, but we got four that are still sitting there that we don't seem to be making much progress on. But again, I think you can look at the optimistic side of it and say the more China invests, the more they're going to have at stake, and hopefully that does drive them to want to be more liberalized in some of their policies, more transparent, et cetera. You'd have to believe that countries that are importing a large portion of their food and sustainability would rather produce it themselves if they could. So how long does it take the Europeans? How long does it take China? How long does it take other countries to adopt and accept technologies that are proven full well here in the U.S. Long pause. <laughs> well, it's it's happening in China. I mean, China has made some some progress. Uh, China, uh, twenty or thirty years ago, was at risk of hunger, and now, I mean, it, in terms of moving out of poverty and above that poverty line and into the middle class, China's had some great success. So, uh, productivity is increasing. Production's increasing, but they're still going to need to import food. I mean, they, they only have, what, 8 or 9% arable land compared to 1.2 billion people uh, eventually and a large middle class. This, uh, India's the same way. India's going to have one of the largest middle classes, uh, maybe even surpassing China in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, so all of these farmers are, are moving up in terms of productivity and innovation adoption, um, but the U.S. is a ag global agricultural powerhouse. We're going to, I think, maintain a certain dominance in terms of agriculture, and that, that is going to be to our benefit, and also to provide s uh, stability for the world. You know, Jeff, you said how long is it going to take. That's why I paused, because it, it depends on what, what you're talking about, certainly. I mean, China's, yes, making progress, but now they're going to run up against problems uh, in management, problems in land ownership. Those are going to be the new constraints on, on yield improvement in the future. Uh, the thing that we're starting to see that's starting to change a little bit to the, to the positive is this discussion about feeding, you know, nine, uh, 9 billion people by 2050. And that's starting to change the dialogue in countries that are working in this. Definitely changing the dialogue in places like Southeast Asia and it's in places in Southeast South America where they're starting to look at 
They need to be worrying about you know, feeding the people and not as worried about the precautionary pr principle. You know, they get lobbied heavily from, from European Union on this subject. There, there's some really good examples where they're getting beyond that argument now and they're really focusing on how are we gonna be able to sustainably feed uh, our population and that's, that's starting to really help. You know what I find interesting is that we, there's this, there's, I think there's this relationship in the news that you hear a lot more about questions of technology when supplies are shorter and in, 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 uh, so you, you hear more about questions of technology when supplies are ample than when they're short. Um, is it that sanitary, phytosanitary sanitary barrier? So then what in, in what environment do we come to a national standard, a global standard of acceptance? Well, it'd be great to see that happening. I mean, so we'd like to see I mean, it happening. We've been looking long at way ways of, of tolerance levels, of acceptable tolerance levels for even a trace, but, but of, a national, of, a, of a global standard. Yeah, well, I think what we're trying to get is, uh, that'd be great. We're trying to get this mutual recognition of safety determinations. You know, that's sort of regulatory cooperation. That's something I think that we're seeing some progress on now that, that gets us down the road towards that. You know, if one country approves it, other countries say, okay, what well, do you approve it? It's good enough for me. That's what I'm talking about. We're starting to see some more progress there that's, that's encouraging. What technologies are being left on the table? I mean, GMO, fine, Th that umbrella of, 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 of how a plant was bred. What are the technologies now that are, are on hold, that are waiting, that, that, are, that are on the sidelines that might come if the global environment was better or if the U.S. environment was better? Andy? Well, I, I think there are some of the GMO products that, that have been put on the shelf and been on the shelf for a while in those industries that are not large industries or not global grains uh, that are traded around the world that companies can sustainably um, uh, maintain registrations and deal with that. We're starting to see this convergence of what I'm calling the Moore's Law in genetics, and, and, and that's not just in plants, it's in animals, it's in humans, of uh, where opportunity is in bringing new uh, products to marketplace. We call them characteristics, you know, try to get the lingo down instead of traits because traits are automatically in the GMO box, but what characteristics can you bring in from uh, a wild relative to make it resistant to certain pests or disease? And there's a lot of research out there. A lot of folks have done some really good things. So how do you bring those to market? Uh, we're having the conversations both domestically and internationally with, with uh, mutual governments and they're going very well. But again, getting governments to keep up with the regulation is, is the question. You've got a lot of things in there, at least from the seed side, with respect to uh, new varieties coming to market that will bring both a farmer benefit, but potentially a, uh, the human benefits of lycopene and tomatoes and uh, resistance and 40% and of their baby leaf spinach is, is organic. Well, the one thing that kills an organic spinach field and the second is downy mildew. If we can get, get downy mildew resistance naturally occurring, you, you don't have to spray and you fit that market. So there's a lot of those things that I wouldn't say necessarily are in the market today or being held from the market, but they're on the verge and we're getting close. And so we need that certainty. Spent some time with, go ahead, Mary, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, one of the things that I think you mentioned too, Lon, lessons learned is, you know, I think we learned big time in GMO 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that if we could have come up with a product that would have made tomatoes uh, tastier, longer, that wouldn't have allowed a banana to go, you know, uh, bad so quickly, um, eyesight with carrots, etc. If we could have come up with those kind of products first before coming up with the major corn soybeans, we might, might, have had, might very well have had a lot better consumer acceptance. So I think, you know, that's in essence. Yeah, and internationally it's, just, it's similar. There are many companies looking at how to improve um, vitamin A content uh, of crops, rice, um, sorghums, millets, et cetera. And, and it's possible to do it. It would bring great benefit actually to the poorest people who actually grow and consume those products, but still uh, barriers to that of so acceptance. The, the question is, is who should educate and how should we educate? Is it an education issue and who's, who's responsibility? Who owns it? And how do we change the tide? Because, I mean, we, we talk about uh, international acceptance. There's been, okay, well, our decisions are science-based. Well, that's your science, not mine. Yeah, well, we've been at this trying to answer that question probably 20 years at least. You know, how do you educate? And every time I, we go through this, you know, okay, well, what we did in the past hasn't worked. Let's try a new approach. 
You know, we tried the you know science to science approach, a government official to government official approach, uh, industry farmers you know approach, um, you know farm wives uh, you know approach, you know mothers talking to mothers. You know, I think all of these are great. They've all sort of helped along the along the way. But we have to continue to learn from what we've done in the past, what has worked, what hasn't worked, because we have to we have to reinvent ourselves again. Yeah, I, I would just add. Um, I attended a couple of years ago a pretty, what I thought. Um, was a was a pretty solid conference uh, held by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN FAO on biotechnology in in agriculture, and uh, I thought it was a great first step, um, bringing together everyone from developing countries, developed countries, EU, U.S., Latin America. Um, it was a good conversation about what are the benefits of of agricultural biotechnology writ large. And it was, it was, I thought, an excellent first step in starting to, to change the conversation. Um, and my understanding is that that, that process of, of dialogue is continuing. So, you know, not only at the consumer level, but at the international multilateral body level, we need to continue to show up, to continue to articulate the benefits of, of these technologies. Because I think that over time, uh, people can change their minds. Mirka, we've noted from even your company, the Good Growth Plan, there's been an, an, a concentrated effort to explain not just a technology, but a, but a way of life and, and, a, and a need for technology. More of that? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's a simplistic answer to your question, but it's nobody's responsibility to carry the message. It's everybody's responsibility. And I think we have to look at it from a multi-pronged approach. But um, again, I, I think that the approach of, of, a, of getting to some of these people who are still hungry um, and talking to them about some of our issues will pay big dividends uh, in the future. I wonder if it's not a caring because when we talk to folks of the FAO this winter, and they have countries where there are a large number of, of food insufficient of their populace, the FAO only educates, the FAO only provides information, but there doesn't seem to be a, a, a passion from some of these countries to satisfy those who are in need. And, and for me, this is frustrating knowing that there are companies, Andy, who have answers, and Mary Kay who have answers, it but necessarily to, governments who don't care. Well, it, it, at, the, at this FAO symposium, um, the most vocal proponents of biotechnology were several of the countries themselves. Bangladesh um, was, uh, was very forthright in asking for this technology. Um, so it has to come from the countries within the FAO body. FAO is, is very much just a, a broad forum. But the countries themselves are beginning to speak out and beginning to ask for more of this technology that would benefit the people in their countries. Would it make a difference if the EU were to suddenly break? And what of that one country that's broken away from the European Union that may now get to think for themselves? Well, that's a great question, Jeff. I, you know, UK was always the one where we had the best track record of, uh, of talking about biotechnology. They were, they were you know, more aligned on our approaches there. I remember a couple of years ago, I went to the World Food Prize and they had a, a panel up there and they had a, a Portuguese farmer. Some of you may have met her. Uh, she was very articulate. She was talking about how you know, the European Union was stifling her production, uh, you know, putting all these restraints on her, regulatory restraints, biotech constraints. She was really complaining about it and making a very, very uh, articulate and well-positioned well case. And this fellow, I was sitting right next to the guy. I think he was the vice minister of agriculture, I believe, from... Uh, uh, Zambia, or, uh, I think it was Zambia. It was, it was an African country, look for sure. And he, he raised the question, question. He raised the question: oh, This is all great. When are you going to stop sending your people down to uh, my country to tell us how to handle our biotechnology? And so that, I do think that these these governments care about these things, and they want to have a more honest discussion. We've had some progress in Africa. The work we've done. In the Bangladesh story is, you know, we you're very correct. That was a good one. Vietnam was another one. Question from the crowd, how does U.S. agriculture need to change as our customer's perspective from providing calories to fulfilling uh, social values? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll look at it quite a little bit different way. I, I think U.S. agriculture needs to embrace, and I think they will, 
expanding demand, but diversifying demand. And that consumers are going to want different things. And they're going to be demanding different things. And I think U.S. agriculture needs to embrace that, that change. It's going to create a lot of opportunity for agriculture looking at this growing and diversifying demand and filling that demand and getting products that they want to see in the marketplace. I, mean, I think that's where U.S. agriculture is headed. Well, and I think with, with U.S. agriculture, it's, it's sort of the two-market mentality, though, too. Mm -hmm. We have a market that's very... Um, I would say disparate, they want local, they, want, they don't know what local is, but they want local, they want natural, they're not sure what natural is, but they want it. And then you look at other countries that we are suppliers to, those developing countries, they want food. It's not an issue of, you know, can I get something that's more natural, organic, and something else. And, and it's what drives the U.S. marketplace, we hope doesn't start to spill over globally in that. But I think the, the, it's amazing what the, the U.S. farmer is doing today to try to get a part of that market, get a part of the, whether it's the local, whether it's the new uh, wheats that are being grown for bread or other things to fill those niches that bring different income onto the farm. But also it's the innovation that they're able to adopt. And so it's not just looking at one singular way for that farmer to adopt, for, to change. It's looking at a, a multitude. I, I just think that, you know, the best way to have this happen is farmer to farmer. And you look at farmers that go out and say, oh, I tried this niche market. It's organic. It's, you know, look at the money I'm making. Well, pretty soon his neighbor sees, indeed, that's what's going on, too. So that's going to benefit. And then I think one of the other things is that, you know, we sort of have to change the mindset of American farmers about, I, I think we hear often, and, and Andy, you talked about, you know, we bring these uh, uh, professors over and we educate them and then they go home. Um, but how many times have we heard farmers say, you know, I don't like to spend all this money into research and then send it to some other country. But I think that's what we're going to have to do to beat the system of people like the European Union uh, that are going to uh, not be with us on those science-based regulations. I think we're going to have to export that kind of knowledge. Um, the ability for, you know, smallholder farmers to do those things to change their mindset before somebody else gets to them. I'm going to go back to what I said about care a minute, and I've got one more question here that, that's come from the group. I remember when the, uh, one of the African countries wouldn't allow us to donate corn because it was genetically enhanced. And those who stand against golden rice, albeit would help their children, it's genetically enhanced. So does it take a new food product? I mean, gee, I looked on the shelf the other day, and I think the missus has bought like six different diet plans. None of those have been open, but hey, what plan are you on? What do you, well, does it take a new food? Does it take a new something that's genetically enhanced to get the consumer to realize, you know, maybe this, this is okay? Well, <laughs> look at me, Jeff, but I, I don't know. I think, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think what really sells first is safe and quality food. And, you know, again, we've had that, those sort of discussions. We had a great project in Tanzania that we're working on right now where that was the, the main hallmark, pushing that into the marketplace. And people were willing to pay more for that, knowing that that egg, it was an egg in this case, was safe. Mm -hmm. So that, in terms of developing countries, that, that's what helps. And, and I think we had a really frustrating experience here about a year or two ago in South Africa where they, you know, this big drought and there was a need to import corn. And we went through a lot, a lot of work, hard work, to get some, some sort of, you know, landing place, you know, safe landing place for biotechnology allowed into the country. And we finally got there, a little, you know, grain moved in from other countries, but it was a long story. But that emergency, start, you know, stimulated that discussion in a positive way. Yeah. I think um, joint research um, in these countries, uh, an example is the Water Efficient Maze for Africa program that multiple, I think it's six different governments are involved in partnership research along with a uh, private sector company like Monsanto and, and the Gates Foundation and other technology um, entities within the region. These are great ways to um, do the research, do the, build the regulatory processes in the region itself rather than parachuting in only and selling food or or supplying it that way, building up that research capacity, um, building up the regulatory capacity. Another example of partnership um, in the Americas is uh, with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, one of the GHI partnerships. 
um, is doing a lot of long-term work in partnership with USDA and governments in, in the Americas to build the capacity of those governments to um, understand and comply with codex regulations. Because sometimes it's just the capacity of, of many countries, it's just not there. So figuring out what is the right mix of, of doing research, doing development, doing capacity building, um, as well as facilitating trade. It's, it's all of the above. All right. This, this technology I see as a three-pronged stool. First of all, you have to have the science, uh, and then you have to have the acceptance, uh, and, and, and it has to be in, in an environment that we can grow. We've had a chance to talk about it here. So let's go to closing comments. Uh, we're with regarding technology, the regulatory system, uh, and, and embracing that as a, as a domestic and a global society. Give us your closing thoughts. And Andy, you can start if you like. Okay. Um, it, it really is amazing where we are today and when we look at uh, uh, biology, plants and animals, and, and the things that we've discovered. We've spent, we as an industry, have spent a great deal of money getting here, I mean, mapping the genome and other things that have really helped us. When I was with Florida Citrus Mutual, we tried to map the genome of citrus and working with our colleagues at, at APHIS, or ARS, excuse me, it was going to be a, above $100 million. They did it seven years ago, a couple of years after I left, and I think it was around $100,000. We're no different than any other area. How do we talk about what we've learned and, and how we have a conversation? We don't need to educate, because then people think we're talking down to it, but how do we have a conversation about how we evolve and where that safety level is, where make them feel comfortable that what is coming to the market is um, uh, an evolution of plant breeding or an evolution of animal breeding or an evolution of pharmaceuticals. They're all in the same boat is because it's our understanding of the human body, the animal, and the plant, and how they tie together. We've got to be out there, and we've got to be talking to different people. We've got to talk to groups of chefs. They're, they're the people that, look, that people look at the most on, on the Internet, you know, about what do I buy. Chefs are influencing that. Mm. You know, so it's a different group of people. But the innovation is not going to stop. Our hope is it doesn't get stifled in the process. So we've got to bring our regulatory community along and uh, uh, just be very, very vocal. Absolutely, and I'll come back to it again, Jeff. I just think we have to do a better job of, our tell of telling our story, and I don't think we focused on this particular aspect very well. I, I just read an article yesterday about uh, you know, the neonics being banned and the fact that USDA came out within the last week or so about a study that said, oh my gosh, uh, bees are down 4% from last year. And you know the stat, the stat was true, but it was 4% from a high of numerous years. I think it's like we got the fourth highest amount of bees in this country or in this world that we've ever had. What's, you know, we're not telling that story. I bet if you had this room full of just everyday citizens, they would all say, oh my gosh, we don't have any bees left in the world. Everything is falling apart. I mean, we just haven't focused on those issues. There are so many things to talk about, certainly, but I think we haven't focused on these kind of issues near enough. Um, I would just um, go back to our, our young leaders who are in the room today, the 4-H um, and, and FFA kids who are here, um, and I just look to you for the future of communication because I think you have, you're the right people, you're the right message, you're the right voice. Um, we can provide perspective from, from our experiences, but I think um, having more of you involved in in symposia like this, getting you up on the stage maybe more, um, and putting you foremost is going to be part of the, the solution to this. Yeah, I would agree with that very wholeheartedly, Margaret. Um, well, I'll go back to, again, one thing that the angst on trade has done over the past years, for me, you know, worrying about that and not worrying about biotech as much as it used to back in 2016. but. It worried me that I, 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 that was a realization that I had the other day. I said, wait a second, we've got to continue this, from an international point of view, we've got to continue this conversation. The conversation, as you said, and I couldn't believe it that more, we've got to continue to not lose sight of the fact that this conversation has to continue. How are we going to feed the world sustainably? Uh, and again, I, I agree with the, the comment about uh, you know, young leaders coming up and having that discussion with their peers, focusing on that and the focusing on, on the reliability and trust, building trust in our agricultural system. I would want to believe that if we could embrace or we could help the consumer understand how these technologies have improved their goal for us with regard to sustainability 
And maybe we tell more stories about the innate potato of how just a simple gene edit is now providing less waste and more food for more people for less money. And, and then maybe if you've been to the restaurant and you've looked at that new kind of burger uh, that is plant-based and you think that's a great thing to step away from the animal industry, then you realize that that bodacious burger or that immaculate burger actually has genetic modification involved in it as well. So ultimately, I think we're all going in the same direction. It's just a matter of what discussion it takes to get us there. Would you give our panelists a, a warm round of appreciation? Thank you.